and gentlemen, may I have your attention. I want to introduce to you in this corner of the good and the right, there stands a champion clothed in white. His height exceeds the heavens, his weight outweighs the world, his reach reaches everywhere, his age is evermore. And he is higher than the highest, he's greater than the greats, no one will ever take his crown away. He's more mighty than the mightiest. He reigns from above. And he's the all-time undisputed, undefeated champion of love. He left his hometown to enter this arena. And he raised his hands in victory for me. And an angry crowd crucified the king that wore the crown. And they gladly watched our champion going down. Oh, but we will never count him out, for we're a witness of the day he rose to retain his title, champion of love. And he is higher than the highest. He's greater than the greats. No one will ever take his crown away. And he's more mighty than the mightiest. And he reigns from above. He's the all-time undisputed, undefeated champion of love. All time undisputed, undefeated champion of love. Take your Bible, please, this afternoon, and I'd like you to turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew. We're going to be reading from verse number one. Of Matthew chapter 23. And we're going to talk about uh, humility, a matter of the heart. You know, in our world of religious folks and the various parts of our society, humility is pretty much frowned upon. And uh, the way that most folks think that we should act is arrogant and proud and boastful. But uh, when a heart has been touched by God, uh, God does a work of humility in the heart. And the Bible tells us in verse number 1 of chapter 23, Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, so this is not only for the multitudes, but in particular for his disciples. And these scribes that he's going to refer to were recorders of the law. And uh, he was going to uh, tell the Pharisees who were the tellers of the law. Uh, the scribes were the recorders and the Pharisees were the tellers, the ones who spoke. He said, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Now, when they talk about Moses' seat, that was a place of great authority and prominence, and it was reserved for those who were the greatest in wisdom. But they wanted to take a position of prominence when they did not really meet the qualifications. All therefore whatsoever 
they bid you observe that observe and do but do not you after their works for they say and they do not for they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers you know how so many folks they have such a high standard of what you have to be in order to go to heaven but then when it turns on them it becomes a different idea altogether I heard two pastors discussing an issue and, and uh, this, this man was arguing with the pastor about the fact that he believed that you reach a point in your Christian life where you don't sin and the pastor simply turned to 1 John and he read what the Bible said and he said if you say that you have no sin you are a liar and he pointed his finger right at him he said you're a liar you have sin I have sin it don't matter who you are you fail and you sin and uh, but people, you know, when I was growing up as a child, uh, there were a lot of religious people. You know, they went to the Holiness Church. My grandmother never cut her hair, never wore makeup, never wore lipstick, never wore slacks. She never kissed Grandpa on the lips. She believed it was an abomination for a woman to kiss a man on the lips. My, my grandma was, I mean... You know, she would, she would put a heavy burden on me about anything and everything, you know, and, and expect me to do these things perfectly. And I realized as a little boy that I could not live up to that standard because I watched my grandma in the kitchen when she would burn her finger or drop something on her toe. I heard what came out of her mouth. And it wasn't always praise God and thank the Lord. And when I would ask her, Grandma, what about that word you said? She'd say, oh, son, I just made a mistake. And, and that would contradict my whole ideas about what sin was. And that's the way the Pharisees were. They, they told everybody, now this is what you got to do, but they didn't do it themselves. You know, we're responsible... If I tell you that you ought to do something, then I better make sure that I'm doing it, that I'm following that. Now, he says they bind heavy burdens and they're grievous to be borne. That's what legalism will do to you. You know, many years ago, uh, people would say, well, if you do this or you do that, you're not even saved. You know, they'd say, well, if a woman cuts her hair, she's not even a Christian. Or if a woman wears slack, she's not even a Christian. Or, if, you know, if you go and see a movie, you're not a Christian. I've heard some preachers stand up. Believe it or not, we went to preach in a, a church up in Ohio, and I was supposed to preach that morning. And when I got ready to preach, I had on a paisley tie. And the preacher took me back into the study and he said, now you're going to have to change that tie. I said, why? He said, we voted in our church that you have to have a solid colored tie when you preach in our church. We, don't, we believe that a paisley or a, you know, a checkered or whatever, that that'd be a sin. And I said, you've got to be kidding me. I said, well, how about I don't wear anything? I'll just take my tie off. So I just took it off. But, uh, you know, people get all these wild ideas about what's righteous and what's not righteous. And, and the basic concept that God gives is modesty. Dress modestly. And if you're modest, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to fit into the culture the way that somebody may suppose you're supposed to fit in. I don't think that even concerns God as long as you are a modest individual with your dress and your way of life. But he said, 
They themselves will not move them with one of their fingers, but all their works they do notice for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries. Now the phylacteries uh, were the, the type of things that they would, they would make boxes and they would put leather straps on them. And these phylacteries would be put on their heads, on their wrists, and they would take scriptures literal, where the Bible would talk about, you know, posting these things on, your, on the doorpost and all that, when the message was, have the Word of God in your heart. Now, we have scriptures up in our home. I love the way that my wife will always put up Bible verses, and you know, because I like to read Bible verses when I go through the house. But now what if I decided I was going to start wearing phylacteries and I'd build me some little cedar boxes and I'd put them on my head and I'd put leather straps on them and then I'd put Bible verses in those phylacteries and I'd put them on my arms and my feet and I'd go around walking. Boy, look at my phylacteries. Look at them. That's what they did. And they would stand on the street corners and they wanted everybody to notice what he says. For they love to be seen of men. That was their whole motive. They make broad their phylacteries. You see, instead of making a just a regular phylactery, no, it couldn't be right. You had to make it real big. Yeah. Yeah, not one of them little ones about like this. Let's just make it where it's about like this, you know. Cover your eyes and everything. They made broad phylacteries and enlarge, now notice, not only they make them broad, but they enlarge the borders of their garments. Because there were certain customs about your garments, and they would wear them a certain length, and that would be acceptable, but they wanted to go beyond acceptable, so they'd wear them all the way down to the ground. Or they'd wear them, instead of here, they'd cover up half their hands. And they wanted to make a scene. A lot of folks like to do that. Is that right? Is that of the heart? Is, does that honor God? I don't think so. He goes on and he says, And love the uppermost rooms at feast, and the chief seats in the synagogue. You know, when they go to a dinner, they want to sit where the big shots are. They want to be noted. They want everybody to go by and take notice of them because they, they want these positions of prominence. And they love the greetings in the markets. And they want to be called Rabbi, Rabbi. <clears throat> I've done a number of funerals in my life, probably, I don't know, a couple hundred funerals. And... Uh, Whenever I do a funeral, I always tell the funeral director, when you put my name in the paper, don't put reverend. And they'll always say, well, why? Aren't you a reverend? And I say, I'm, a, I'm an ordained pastor, but I am not a reverend. No, why, are you don't, why don't you like reverend? So I take them to the Word of God and show them that the Bible says reverend and holy is His name. I don't want to be a reverent. I'm not a reverent. I'm an under-shepherd. The Bible says a pastor should be called an under-shepherd, an elder, a, a brother, an overseer, but never is he supposed to be called a reverend. But a lot of men like that. And then they like to put Ph.D. Uh, I've had several men tell me, so why don't you go ahead and get your doctorate? And we'll get your PhD so you can put it out on your church sign. People drive by and they'll say, look at there, Tony Harrell, PhD. And I don't, I don't need that many hours to, to finish up and get a PhD, but I thought about that and I thought, Lord, you know, if I were to do something like that, would that benefit me in the ministry or would it just be something I would do in order to make people think that I'm really something? I don't know. I struggled with that. Uh, even, if, even if I had a doctorate, 
I would not want people calling me doctor. I'm a pastor. I'm a servant. I'd rather be, I'd rather be a servant. Uh, the Bible says that they love these things. They love the greetings in the market. Call me rabbi, rabbi. But he, but be not you called rabbi, for one is your master. Uh, the title rabbi was a prominent name. It was a name of, of uh, relevance. And uh, it was never a name that God gave. So he says, don't be called by that name. And uh, one is your master, even Christ and all your brethren. And call no man your father. I heard some fellow talking about the Pope and called him the Holy Father. He's not a father and he's not holy. He's anything but holy. He's lost as he can be. If, you hear, if you've ever heard him talk about salvation, he believes that salvation is by works and through the Catholicism. He doesn't know the Lord. And yet people will want to bow down to him and kiss his feet or kiss his ring. Call no man your father. I've been in elevators with priests before. They call themselves priests. And uh, remember one man was there and I, I called him by a certain name. I can't remember. I asked him, you know, what do you think about this? And he said, when you address me, please call me Father. And I said, listen, my father's dead. And my other father lives in heaven. I won't call you Father. He said, call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. You say, well, does that mean that we can't call dad father? No, that's not the idea. The idea is where you attach some kind of dramatic respect to a name where you lift somebody up with this name that only belongs to God. Neither be you called, now here's the real point, Neither be ye called masters. A master. A lot of people like to say, well, I'm an expert. I talked with a guy that worked on, uh, did small engine repair, and he told me, he said, yeah, I'm an expert on engine repair. And uh, I said, oh, you are, huh? He said, yeah, I'm an expert. Well, Neither be you called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. Master's degree. I remember when I, when I did get my master's degree uh, in theology, uh, I thought about that a lot. But he that is greatest among you, what shall he be? Your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Humility is a position before the Lord and conveyed in how we conduct our daily lives. Humility is not thinking less of oneself, but thinking rather of oneself less. It is not uh, self-depreciating or mocking, but it is truly living in such a way that you're retaining, you're staying away and refraining from arrogance or narcissism in order to serve the Lord and to rightly serve others. When we think about the prayers in the Bible for a humble heart, Here's a man who prayed a prayer for a humble heart. We pray for the heart position of humility. Humility in such a way that we do not cheapen our own worth or value, but that we take the alignment that we are here for a greater purpose than just for our own gain. We pray that you will highlight to us what it truly means to live a humble life. 
and that our own worth will be revealed by the light of your word. It is only then that we may truly live in freedom and a right standing with God, for we will hold our own value correctly. Lord, we welcome you to mold and secure our hearts in true humility by your leading hand. Jesus often prayed to his Father, and oftentimes he would pray, Thy will be done, not my will be done. He prayed to his heavenly Father, even though he was the second person of the Godhead. Jesus Christ became a man before he was a man, he was in eternity with God. He was God. He always has been. Before Abraham was, he was. He's the great I am. And yet, when he walked this earth, he said, my will is to do the will of him who sent me. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is found in the book of Micah chapter 6 verse 8 where the Lord makes mention of what he requires the Lord has told you what is good and what is acceptable and what is required of you but to do justly now that word to do justly in the Hebrew means to do the right thing you know, in almost every part of life, there's a right thing and there's a wrong thing. Many times we don't do the right thing. But we ought to strive to do the right thing. Sometimes I don't approach my wife the right way. And I have to try and back up and do it the right way. Sometimes I don't approach my children the right way. Sometimes I don't approach God the right way. And I have to back up and say, Lord, forgive me. I should not take you for granted. I should not have this kind of attitude toward you. Oh, Lord, what is just and what does the Lord require of thee? But to do justly and to love mercy. Not only practice mercy, but to love mercy. You know, most folks, they love everything but mercy when it comes to dealing with others. When somebody, anymore, you know, you go to pay your, your bill at the, uh, if you stop and get food, or you go to the cashier and they ring you up, and they'll say $8 and and 22 cents, do you want to give the rest to this? Or, or you just want me to, to you know, to take it on up to the next solid number? And I say, no, ma'am. I really need that money back because, you know, I need to take count. Now, if, if the woman needed the 80 cents to buy her food, I'd gladly say, yeah, you take it and use it. But a lot of times, we, uh, we don't want to have mercy having mercy means that we go beyond what the norm would be and we, we go the extra mile that's what Jesus talked about he says if your brother asks you to go one mile go with him two miles and if your brother asks you for just your cloak we'll give him your coat too don't just don't just do what is ask of you, but go beyond and do more. To do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. We ought to choose to walk humbly with God. Because remember, when God looks down from His throne in heaven, it's about looking, about like looking at a bunch of little ants. 
You know, we walk across the ground and maybe you walk out in your yard and you don't see the little ants that are under your feet and you may kill 10 ants and you don't even know anything about it. Or maybe you kill a, a honeybee because you had shoes on, you didn't feel the sting. Or maybe you run over a squirrel on the road with your car or whatever may happen. You know, you don't intend to do it, but you just do it. And God looks down upon us. And uh, according to Isaiah, that we're not even considered as dust on the scale. That's right. You know, like what if a man were going to weigh out the food you bought, he don't take a rag and clean the dust off because he's afraid the dust will make it way more. That's what God says, that we're like dust on the scale. But yet God takes note of us. So if He'll do that, how much should we walk humbly before our God? Help us to hear You clearly, Lord. For we do want to walk not by pride or self-sufficiency, but we want to walk in humility with you. Another man <clears throat> prayed this prayer for a, a humble spirit. And he said, Today we ask for your help to walk humbly with our brothers and sisters. It is all too easy for us to fall prey to our flesh and to walk in arrogance but pride always causes division and we want peace Lord help us to humble ourselves in order that we do not let the ties of the enemy overtake us rather help us to count ourselves as equals or less than one another it is then that we will stop attempting to be better than other people. And we can love their heart. We can love the unique person, the one you made to be your child, your worker, and to value them with a humble spirit so that we may live life to its fullest. Now, the Bible has a lot to say about humility. Uh, we've already covered one in Matthew 23. And there's another one in James chapter 4, verse 6. And there the Bible says that God gives more grace, that God resists the proud, but that God shows favor to the humble. He resisteth the proud, but he shows grace to the humble. Philippians chapter 2, Paul says in verse 3 that we're not to do anything for self-glory with a, a conceited heart. I'm paraphrasing. But we're to do it with humbleness of mind and that we're to look on one another as being more important than we are and we're not to look merely on the outward part of our own personal interest but we're to look at the interest of others what would make that person happy what would help that person instead of what do I want to do to make me happy or to be what I want done. I think that's one of the keys for a happy marriage is learning how to understand that our marriages thrive when we honor and humble ourselves to each other. When we serve each other. When we do good to each other. And by all means, allow your mate to serve you. If your mate desires to be humble and serve you, then by all means accept that graciously. 
Don't act like you're too good to receive it because we're not. The Bible talks about that uh, a person who has a humble heart is also a person that is gentle, that is patient, that is uh, long-suffering and bearing with other people in Ephesians 4 verse 2. And we've all heard Proverbs 18, 12 that before destruction there comes uh, arrogance and a haughty spirit and humility comes before there will be honor. It takes a long time to learn how to humble yourself and to be kind to other people to love people and to think about them instead of thinking about yourself. First Peter, let's turn there for just a moment. First Peter chapter 5, verse 5. I don't know about you, but I, I need... I need to study and dwell on humility a great deal because I find my pride is always a problem in my life. And I want my heart to be right with God. I want to have a humble spirit. Uh, Peter tells us there that uh, the younger are to submit themselves to the elder. And that all of us are to be clothed with humility toward one another. You know why? Because God is set against the proud. God hates the proud. But He will bless the humble in heart. In due season, He will lift you up. You think about that. You think about the fact that we ought to be clothed with humility. Not many of us are. In Proverbs 11, when pride comes, there comes disgrace, there comes humility. When humility comes, there, there comes wisdom. And uh, we're also told that uh, there are some things that we do that promote uh, humility in our life. And they're all things that are different from promotion of the flesh. Again, in 1 Peter 3, he talks about this in verse 3. He's talking about husbands and wives and their relationships. How that a woman can win her lost husband. Whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair and wearing of gold or putting on of apparel. Now women can dress up and, and put on makeup and they can be very attractive and beautiful. But that's not where the real beauty lies. The real beauty lies in a humble heart. Sometimes they will they'll show these beautiful, attractive females on TV, and you'll say, My, that's that is a beautiful lady. And then she opens her mouth and starts talking, and you go, Wow, she is not beautiful at all. She is full of, of herself. And I remember one of the sayings we used to, they used to say all the time in school, they'd say, that guy's he's handsome and he knows it. Or she's pretty and she knows it. And when she knows it, she lets everybody else know about it too. But he says, let it be, in verse 4, the hidden, the hidden man, the hidden part of the heart in that which is not corruptible. Now how does that happen? In an ornament, what is an ornament? It's something that 
You put on something to decorate it, to make it look nice. Well, what are the ornaments that really make a woman look beautiful? A meek and a quiet spirit. Meekness. Quietness. Proverbs talks a lot about a man in a house with a leaky roof and a whining woman or a griping woman. You know, you, you just can't, if all, if all people do is just gripe and whine and complain all the time, it's hard to put up with that. So he says, the way that a woman can ornament her beauty is by having a, a meek and quiet spirit which is in the sight of God of great price. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's compared to a, a, a treasure in a field. I heard a man, and, and he'd been single, he's up in his 40s, and I asked him, he said, why haven't you ever, why haven't you ever gotten married? And he kind of snorted and he said, get married? He said, I've never found a woman that I could live with for 20 minutes, let alone marry her. Now, I don't know if that was his fault, or, but I'm telling you, it's not easy in this world to find people who, who have been brought up in truth and who have a humble and meek spirit. Most of the time they want to rule. They want to, uh, they want to tell you what to do and how to run your life. Now maybe we can use some of that sometimes. But if we do that constantly, that is not revealing a humble heart. And then he goes on and he says, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner in old time, the holy women also who trusted in God, how did they adorn themselves? With a meek and quiet spirit, being in subjection unto their own husbands. Oh, ooh, that's a dirty word. Being in subjection to their own husbands? Listen, I didn't say that. God did. If a woman is not willing to submit herself unto her husband as unto the Lord, she should not get married. And if a husband is not willing to love his wife the way Christ loved the church, that means that he's willing to die for her. Oftentimes in marriage counseling, before a couple of young couples get married, I look right at the young man and I say, are you willing to die for her? Would you lay down your life for her right now? Well, I don't know about that. Well, that's what God says you're to do. You love her the way Christ loved the church. How did He love the church? He gave His life. And I'm not saying this because of pride. I, 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 I think I understand my heart a little. But I would gladly die for my wife. I would lay my life down to help her and to spare her. And I wouldn't even have a second thought about it. And I know she'd do the same for me. Well, where does that come from? That comes from God. That doesn't come from within this selfish flesh. To love in spite of, not because of, not if love, not because of love, but in spite of love. To love unconditionally. This is the way that uh, the women of old behaved. Likewise, you husbands, deal with them according to to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. That didn't mean that she is somehow inferior or that she's to be taken advantage of. 
But God made a woman to be feminine. She's not big and broody and now, not all of them. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't say that, but she's, she's a woman. And women normally are not like men. That's why you can't have men who think they're women who are biological men on the swim team with women or competing with them in basketball or whatever it may be. They're different by biologically they're different people. They're made different. And if we don't understand that, we are some messed up people. And you see what's been happening. But he says, as heirs together of the grace of life. And then notice this, don't forget this, that your prayers be not hindered. The Bible says that God chooses the lowly, the base things of this world, and the things that are despised, and the things that are, are not, to bring to naught the things that are, that there would be no way for us to boast before Him in 1 Corinthians 1.26. Now as we close, I'm sorry, I've taken quite a bit of time. Humility is important because it sets things in proper order and proper perspective. The enemy would have us thrown into arrogance and pride which shows through the lens in which we see the world and how we see others. God wants something better. And it's when we are clothed in humility that our hearts can think clearly. We recognize that we are not above others. Rather, we are all unique as children of God, equal in His sight. Humility blesses us to walk in true freedom, no longer weighed down by the weight of competition. You don't have to be better than me. I don't have to be better than you. We just be who we are and thank God for what God has done in our lives. Humility blesses us to have that kind of freedom. It is in seeking a humble heart that we can walk and live to be a blessing to others, a blessing in the kingdom, and to be open to the blessings of life. Part of following Christ, humility of self. The Lord Himself humbled Himself as a human to walk among us. In the book of Philippians, the Bible says He, he thought of Himself not highly. He didn't take upon Himself any reputation. He made of Himself no reputation, but was made in the likeness of sinful man. I looked up a prayer of a missionary and it really touched my heart. Here's what it says. We look at things, people, and places for grace. We try to reveal grace. We forget to embrace grace. And we think that we can earn grace when all we really need to do is surrender our hearts and receive grace. Let the true grace that only God can give wash over our sinful bodies and settle down deep into our rebellious souls. Then shall we find a place of strength and a place of quiet fortitude quite a prayer of a humble man who was given his life to be a servant of God